materials available for you. So we're going to have a hard copy of the PowerPoint. We're going to have a detailed press release that will actually contain more information than what we'll go through with you today and several attachments as well. We'll also have a disk for you that will contain all the written materials and all the photos that we're using today. So hopefully that'll be enough to answer all your questions and then you can obviously contact me if you have questions afterwards. I want to introduce the three people who will be speaking today. Uh, this is Captain Ryan Grant from the Manchester Police Department. He's a supervisor in the detective unit there. This is State Police Sergeant Michael Kokoski. He's a supervisor at the New Hampshire Cold Case Unit. My name is Jeff Strelzen. I'm a Senior Assistant Attorney General at the New Hampshire Attorney General's Office uh, where I'm assigned as the Homicide Chief. We're here today because in almost every homicide case that we work on, probably the most important starting point that we have is the identity of the victim or the victims. It's that information that usually leads you to the killer. And in the case involving the four murder victims in Allenstown, we believe we've identified their killer. And now we're hoping that by releasing that information and information about the killer, that that will help identify those victims in the case and other victims that we believe this killer is responsible for. In 1985, an adult female and a female child were found in a barrel on a property in Allenstown, New Hampshire, next to Bear Brook State Park. Those are the two victims on the left. The adult female and the child we refer to as the oldest child. In 2000, a second barrel was found on that same property about 100 yards away from the first barrel. And in that barrel were two more female victims we refer to as the middle child and the youngest child. And again, we've never been able to identify these four victims, but we believe we've identified their killer. And we also believe that the same man that killed these four people in Allenstown likely killed Denise Bowden, who went missing in Manchester in 1981. This is Denise Bowden. She went missing in the fall of 1981 from Manchester, New Hampshire. At the time she went missing, she had a six-month-old daughter. That daughter, who's now known as Lisa, is alive and well, and we'll tell you more about her later on in the press briefing. When Denise and Lisa went missing in 1981, they were with this man. A man that we've come to know went by many different names across the country. In New Hampshire, he was known as Bob Evans. Bob Evans left New Hampshire in 1981 with Denise Bowden and her infant daughter, Lisa, and Denise was never seen or heard from again. However, we know that Evans kept that little girl with him for several years. And around the time she was five or six, he gave her away to some people in California, and she was eventually adopted. After Evans gave away Lisa, he fled the area to avoid apprehension by the police. He used other names to avoid apprehension. And for about a 12-year period, he went missing. And then around 2002, he met a woman in Richmond, California, named Yunsun Jun. He married June in an unofficial backyard ceremony and ended up killing her in 2002. After she was missing for several months, the police located her partially dismembered body buried in the basement of the home where Evans and June lived. Evans was eventually charged with murder. He pled guilty in 2003 and was sentenced to 15 to life in prison in California. And in 2010, he died in prison of natural causes. This man, Bob Evans, is not only connected to Denise Bowden's disappearance and the California murder of Yoon Sun Jun, he's also connected to the four Allenstown murder victims. Through DNA testing, we've determined that this man, this killer, Bob Evans, is the father of the middle child victim in Allenstown, this young girl. He is not the father or related to the other victims, but he is, in fact, the father of this middle child victim. He's also the last person we know who was with Denise Bowden and her daughter Lisa in 1991. And we know he's the man who murdered Yunsan Jun in California in 2002. 
based on those connections and the additional work that we've done and the evidence we've gathered, we're confident that Bob Evans is the person who killed the four victims in Allenstown. We have concerns about the mother of that middle child and believe she may be dead as well. And we believe that he killed Denise Bowden somewhere between New Hampshire and California. We believe that Bob Evans likely killed all those people and that his killing finally came to an end in California in 2002 with his last victim, Yoon Sung Joon. So to summarize, we believe we have our killer of the Allen Sound victims and of Denise Bowden. Now we need to try to identify and find all of his victims. And that's why we're here today. That's why we're going to release as much information as we can about Bob Evans, his background in history, and the victims that we know about. And the hope is that making those connections will provide the information out there that's necessary for someone or some people to come forward and help us identify these victims and provide closure for all of them. We're going to start giving you more details now. The next speaker is going to be Captain Ryan Grant from the Manchester Police Department. Uh, Ryan, is going to, Ryan is going to take you through the Denise Bowden case and some of the connections and information we know about Bob Evans. Good morning. So <clears throat> some of what I'll, I'll give you is uh, will be repetitive of what Attorney Strausen just told you about, but we'll uh, supplement that with some photographs uh, and some further information. So we know uh, that Bob Evans arrived here in New Hampshire uh, sometime in the late 1970s. Uh, we know that he lived at 925 Hayward Street in Manchester uh, until the disappearance of uh, he, Denise, and uh, the approximately six-month-old baby, Don. Uh, they disappeared uh, in November or early December of 1981. Uh, it was in the few days following uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, at the time, uh, there was no missing report uh, filed with authorities, so there was no search done of the residents uh, at that time. We don't know uh, too much about the condition uh, after they left, whether it was uh, void of furniture or belongings, but we do know uh, that the residents were gone, and that included uh, Bob Evans, Denise Bowden, uh, and the baby Don. Uh, recently, as uh, I know has been covered in the press, uh, 925 Hayward Street, uh, the basement of that residence has been uh, searched extensively uh, by MPD or Manchester PD detectives along with uh, representatives of the FBI uh, evidence response team. They spent about uh, three or three and a half days there uh, processing the scene. Yeah, as you can see here, uh, excuse me, see here in the, uh, this would be the entrance to 925 Hayward Street. <clears throat> so during, uh, shortly after they went uh, missing, excuse me, one slide here. So this is some background information about Denise Baldwin. Uh, Bowden, uh, as I said, she uh, disappeared with her child and Bob uh, just after Thanksgiving. Here is some uh, information about her, uh, her age, her description, and obviously a uh, picture of her. Uh, during the time that uh, Mr. Evans had been living at 925 Hayward Street, uh, an interesting note, uh, there was some certified mail sent to that residence, and it had been signed for by uh, somebody purporting to be Elizabeth Evans. We don't know who Elizabeth Evans was, whether or not she, in fact, uh, was a real person or if it, uh, the uh, mail had been signed for by somebody else. Also, what's interesting, uh, during the time uh, in the 1980s, Bob Evans had been arrested three different times uh, by local authorities. He was arrested in February in June of 1980, and he gave his spouse's name uh, as being Elizabeth, as you can see here in the, in the slide. Uh, when he was arrested in October of 1980, uh, he did not list a spouse at all. Uh, whether that's a sim simply he just didn't give an answer, or if there's something more to that, but we don't know who Elizabeth Evans is or was at that time. 
these are uh, some photographs from that time frame. Oh, excuse me. Uh, as you can see, uh, that's a picture of Denise Bowden, and this is Bob Evans. Uh, this was taken uh, during the summer of 1981. Uh, it appears that uh, Denise is pregnant, presumably, uh, well, not presumably, with uh, her daughter Dawn. And these photographs were taken on Lita Ave in Manchester, New Hampshire. So as we uh, connect the New Hampshire case out to California, uh, we s sort of lost uh, a, a bit of time uh, with Mr. Evans between 1981 and 1984. Uh, not exactly sure of his whereabouts. Uh, we do know that in 1984 and 1985, he's hired as an electrician under the name of Curtis Kimball. Uh, that's in Los Alamitos, California. Uh, 1985, uh, the person now going under the name of Curtis Mayo, Mayo Kimball, who we now know as Bob Evans, uh, was arrested in Cypress, California for DWI, endangering a child and hit and run of a pro of property. Uh, investigative reports from that incident indicate that he was uh, under the influence and was involved in a car crash with Lisa, uh, or the young child we know uh, to be Don Bowden uh, in the vehicle with him. So uh, between uh, January and July of 1986, Mr. Evans is living and working at a place by the name of Holiday Host RV Park uh, in Scotts Valley, uh, under the name of Co uh, Gordon Curtis Jensen. Uh, at, during that time frame, he had this young child with him. Uh, he referred to her as Lisa. Uh, and we now know, uh, as I've said, Lisa was in fact Don Bowden, Denise Bowden's daughter. Uh, after a uh, period of time at this RV, RV park, Mr. Evans abandons uh, Lisa and leaves her with a family that had also been staying at this this transient RV park. Uh, this family uh, keeps her for a short amount of time and then uh, notify authorities where she's eventually placed into foster care and uh, subsequent to that she was adopted. Uh, shortly thereafter in August of 1986, Mr. Evans uh, was invent, uh, investigated by the Santa Cruz and San Bernardino County uh, for desertion of, of the child uh, that child being Lisa, for having left her with, uh, with people at this RV park. Uh, by the time the case was investigated and they had put together uh, what was going on, uh, Mr. Evans uh, or Curtis Jensen uh, or one of the other aliases, Mr. Ed, we'll refer to him as Mr. Evans, had now fled the area. So as part of the uh, abandoned child investigation, the uh, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office uh, confirmed through latent fingerprints that Gordon Jensen, the man that had abandoned Lisa, uh, or Don Bowden, was in fact the same person who had been arrested for DUI endangering the child uh, in 1985 in Cypress, California. And at that point, uh, again, he had identified himself, as you can see in the slide here, as Curtis Mayo Kimball. Uh, in October of 1986, uh, Three arrest warrants were issued in the name of Cord Gordon Curtis Jensen, uh, who had also, again, been known at this point. So now we're up to three names with Curtis Mayo Kimball, Gordon Curtis Jensen, and also uh, Robert or Bob Evans, as the people in New Hampshire knew him by. Uh, subsequent to this, uh, we kind of lost track of Mr. Evans for about two years. We don't have any investigative information of, of his whereabouts, uh, but the next time he turns up, is in San Luis Obispo, uh, California. Uh, he's now using the name Jerry Markerman, and he's arrested uh, for driving a stolen motor vehicle. The picture you see here uh, is from a news account of the, that incident uh, at that time. You can see the, the appearance is similar uh, to some pictures, but also you'll see some pictures uh, subsequent to this that where he had a real long shaggy beard it seems like that was atypical for him at the time frame. I, I guess it's important to note that uh, that vehicle, uh, as I said, we had lost track of him for a while. The next time he pops up, uh, he's now driving a vehicle that had been stolen from Idaho. So we know at some point he had been spending some time in Idaho. We don't know how much time he was there. Uh, 
but we do know he was there for a period of time. So uh, March of 1989, so just a few months after he had been arrested while driving that stolen vehicle, uh, while he's still incarcerated, uh, the fingerprint evidence begins to, to come to fruition, and now they realize that Jerry Mockerman uh, is actually uh, wanted uh, for, the, for some warrants that had been put out by Santa Cruz, California, and they realize that uh, Cor Gordon Curtis Jensen and Jerry Mockerman are uh, one and the same person. Uh, with that information, uh, he was sentenced to three years in prison. Uh, in October of 1990, Evans was paroled after serving about 18 months of a three-year sentence, and uh, he absconded the next day. He took off and uh, wasn't seen for, for a period of time. Uh, the following month, uh, as it says here, the parole warrant was issued for Curtis Mayo Kimball. Uh, and, and this is where uh, we really have a big block of time where we don't know uh, where Mr. Evans went. Uh, he, we lose track of him for about 12 years. He's a fugitive and we don't have a lot of information about where he was during that time frame. So M Mr. Evans next uh, pops up in uh, about 2001 and he turns up in Richmond, California under the name of Lawrence William Vanner. Uh, he had, uh, we know uh, some information, he had arrived there, uh, had been hanging out in some local neighborhoods. He was always a handyman, an electrician, he, uh, and he picked up some odd jobs and eventually uh, got a job where he was able to uh, negotiate for a room and do some odd jobs for people in the neighborhood and customers of local businesses. And this is where, uh, how he met Yunsoon June. Uh, he had done some roofing work for her uh, out in that Richmond area. And uh, in August of 2001, uh, he marries Ms. June uh, in a backyard wedding. We know uh, that no marriage, official marriage paperwork was filed with the, the county or local authorities, but uh, from uh, investigative interviews and other information, we do know that they, they had uh, the backyard wedding. Uh, in September of 2002, uh, the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office in California began an investigation uh, into the missing, uh, a missing person for Yunsoon June. Uh, this was about a year after they had uh, become married. And uh, just a short time later, they find, uh, as Attorney Strelzen had told you about previously, they find uh, Ms. June uh, had been murdered, dismembered, and was in, buried in the basement uh, of her residence. Uh, it was determined that uh, her manner of death was homicide. In 2000, uh, November of 2002, Mr. Evans was arrested for the murder of Ms. June, and he was sentenced to a 15 to year, uh, 15 to year. 15 years to life uh, prison term. As uh, Attorney Strelzen told you, he uh, died while incarcerated in, on December 28th of 2010. So as the story continues and uh, the goal becomes to find out uh, who this child, uh, Lisa, or now we know Don Bowden, uh, DNA testing determines that Bob Evans and this little girl, Lisa, or Don Bowden, uh, that he had abandoned in the campground many years before were not biologically related. Uh, it was not his uh, biological daughter. Uh, the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office under, begins a investigation uh, to try to determine who this young girl going by the name of Lisa Jensen is. Uh, in 2014, they enlisted the help of the DNAadoption.com and one of their search angels, uh, genealogist uh, Barbara Ray Venter, to identify any links of relatives to Lisa. In 2016, a first cousin of Lisa was identified, which led to proving that Lisa was, in fact, Don Bowden, uh, Denise Bowden's daughter. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Mike Kokoski from the New Hampshire State Police. Just briefly before Mike speaks, 
Uh, we met, Captain Grant mentioned the search at Hayward Street that was done. Uh, we just want to let you know that Denise was not found there. No human remains were found there. Uh, the FBI and Manchester PD did an extensive search, the, the first one that's been done there. Uh, no signs of human remains. There were signs that the basement floor, which is dirt, had been disturbed. Uh, there's going to be some testing done and some materials that were found there, but there were no human remains found there. No signs of Denise were found in the home. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Mike Kukowski. Mike's going to talk a little bit more about the connections that we have to the Allen Sound case and Lisa as well. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Continuing off of Captain Grant's uh, last slide and the new information developed by San Bernardino County, that brings us to the summer of 2016 when San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department reached out simultaneously to both the New Hampshire State Police and the Manchester Police Department. The purpose in doing so, obviously they just discovered that the Manchester Police Department likely now had a historic uh, unreported missing persons case uh, that, that had not been uh, known about for decades, and also that this subject, Bob Evans, who was now tied to a California homicide, was of interest uh, as a, a possible connection not only to the Manchester area, to, but to the Allenstown area as well, uh, in the unidentified homicide victims in Allenstown. In the summer and fall of 2016, the New Hampshire State Police and the Manchester Police Department work cooperatively together with a number of other agencies to begin researching the subject Bob Evans and the potential links between all of these cases. In October of 2016, amongst uh, numerous investigative and research follow-up tasks uh, that were uh, undertaken in those efforts, we learned through DNA work done at Bodie Cellmark Technologies that Bob Evans is in fact the father of the middle Allenstown child one of the younger children who was found in the barrel in 2000. Recapping a little bit on the Allenstown victims and the particulars, the adult female and the oldest child were found in 1985 in the first barrel. There was a gentleman out hunting on the property near Bear Brook State Park uh, who found those remains. It was 15 years later in the year 2000 that Trooper John Cody went back out and found uh, the second barrel containing the two younger victims. All of the four victims would appear Caucasian. These are the most recent images right here, uh, thanks to the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. These were done up in 2015. The adult female is estimated to be 23 to 33 years old. We think that uh, mid-20s is most likely in terms of her age, with brown hair. The oldest child has an age range of 5 to 11. We think that that actual age is probably closer to the higher end, closer to 11, and that's the case with the other two children as well. We've given an age range, but we think that it's probably on the higher end of each. The oldest child had brown or blonde hair and pierced ears. The middle child, the child that is the daughter of Bob Evans, two to four years old, again, we think on the higher end, with brown hair and with a noticeable overbite. And then the youngest child, age one to three, again, more towards the higher end on the age range, brown or blonde hair with a noticeable gap in her front teeth. I want to just take a moment to recognize that this case historically and certainly presently with these recent developments uh, has been the result of a lot of cooperative work amongst a number of different agencies. Obviously our New Hampshire law enforcement agencies here, uh, but beyond that we've had tremendous support from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, from the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, and also more recently from our California counterparts at San Bernardino County and Contra Costa County. In terms of kinship of the victims, this information was released in, in the last press conference in 2015. The adult female in Allenstown, the oldest child and the youngest child, based on the DNA testing done, are all maternally related. The middle child, the child that we now know, is fathered by Bob Evans, has always been somewhat of an outlier from that group and is not maternally related to the other three. As you may recall, in the 2015 press conference, there was also some testing done regarding isotopes uh, in an attempt to gauge where these victims may have been in the time pre immediately preceding their death. 
and in the time leading up to it. Essentially what that isotope uh, testing showed was that the three, the, the three that are maternally related, the adult, the oldest child, and the youngest child, had likely spent uh, their entire lifetime together and were likely from the northeast region. The middle child was somewhat different, and I'll get to that in the next slide. But again, the, the results from the isotopes indicate that these three females here uh, grew up in the same area. These are the isotope maps from 2015, again, just showing that difference. Uh, principally, it was that while we believe all of the victims were in the same area together in the time immediately preceding their death, in terms of the time prior to that, uh, it seemed that the middle child, the one fathered by Bob Evans, was perhaps from further inland and further north than the other three. Again, obviously, the, the significant development here, and again, thank you to the, the testing provided by Bodie Selmark via the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, is that Bob Evans is the father of that middle Allenstown child. He is not the father of either of the two other children. Due to the, the degradation of the sample of the adult female, a no complete comparison has been made between the adult female and Bob Evans, but based on the other circumstances, uh, we don't expect that there's any relationship there. So connecting this all to what this means for the Allenstown homicide case and, and the, the other matters that we have connected to Bob Evans and some more links. As Captain Grant stated, in the late 1970s, and that's the best approximation we can put on it, to about 1981, Bob Evans was here in New Hampshire, living at 925 Hayward Street. And at that same time, up until about 1980, he was working at the Wombeck Mill in Manchester as a mechanic and as their head electrician. The mill at that time was undergoing the process of being shut down, uh, and Bob Evans uh, was supervising all the electrical work uh, related to that. In the capacity of that employment, Mr. Evans worked directly under the gentleman who owns the Allenstown property where these victims were found and still owns it. For the purposes of this presentation, we've kept his name out of it to respect his privacy but he was Bob Evans' supervisor at the Wombeck Mills. Beyond that connection, we've confirmed that Evans was also hired by that individual to perform some electrical and refrigeration work at the small camp store that was operated on the Allenstown property uh, in the early 1980s. That obviously provides a direct link uh, of Bob Evans not only to one of the victims via the DNA, but to the scene itself in Allenstown. <clears throat> In terms of similarities in the crimes, the Allenstown adult and the oldest child, the two victims found in 1985, were packaged uh, in, in various material, most notably garbage bags, and electrical wire was used as the binding uh, to essentially hold, hold those packages together. Significance there is obviously given uh, Evan's trade as an electrician. Uh, that's a small link. In a somewhat ironic twist, the cable used on the Allenstown victims was made by the Carroll Cable Company, which happens to be the Manchester-based company uh, where Denise Bowden worked for a time. That's a very common cable, so I don't know that that should be read into too much, but again, uh, it was in fact Carroll Cable that was used uh, in, on these victims in Allenstown. All of the victims in Allenstown and Yun Sun Jun, his victim in 2002 in Richmond, California, the cause of death for all, all five of those victims is blunt force trauma. Regarding the Allenstown adult, the Allenstown child, and Yun Sun Jun, they all sustained uh, various degrees of dismemberment before being deposited. Uh, and as, as previously stated, Yun Sun Jun was uh, buried in the basement that the, the couple shared and covered in a, a large amount of kitty litter. We've confirmed that during the time that Evans was working at Wombeck, that not only did he have uh, access and connection to the Allenstown property, but it was known that material from the mill was uh, dumped on that property. Regarding the barrels themselves that the victims were found in, while we can't specifically say that those two barrels are traced directly back to Wombeck, based on everything else we've learned, we think it's very likely. We, we know that barrels were brought from Wom Wombeck to the property, um, and we think that's likely where the source of these barrels and where they came from. So recapping generally the things that are known about the subject Bob Evans. We have a uh, age range, a date of birth range, 1936 to 1952. That's based on 
numerous dates of birth that he has given over the, over the years that he was alive in the various places he was. Um, there's, there's multiple dates of birth, and based on the age that he appeared to be when he died in 2010, we believe he's born likely in the 1940s at some point, um, perhaps a little sooner, perhaps a little later. Again, he died in prison in Susanville, California in 2010. We know that he changed names frequently, and frankly, we do not know the true identity of the subject right now. He had five main aliases. The only name that we know, we know that he used here in New Hampshire is the Robert Evans name. As you heard, he also used Curtis Kimball, Gerald Mockerman, Gordon Curtis Jensen, and Lawrence William Vanner. Uh, Lawrence Vanner was the name uh, he was using upon the investigation into Yun Sun Jun's death in 2002. His occupation was an electrician and a mechanic. We don't know that he was formally employed there, but we have information that he uh, did some projects working at the Manchester VA here in New Hampshire. We suspect that he may have been in the military. We've got multiple research efforts underway attempting to confirm that. Obviously, it's difficult since we don't know his true identity, but our federal law enforcement partners are helping us with that. Anecdotally, some of the things that we've heard from people who knew him suggest that perhaps he had a military background, um, and within that, it's suspected that perhaps it's a Navy background. Based on the subject's own admissions over the years that we have, um, and again, some of the anecdotal evidence, we believe he was a heavy drinker, essentially for the, the duration of his whole life. And he was certainly transient. I would say 925 Hayward Street is the only uh, established dwelling that he had for a, a period of time. Uh, during his time in California, when we can account for him, uh, he frequented campgrounds, uh, mobile home parks, and motels, uh, and was very, very transient. Uh, he ultimately, in 02, uh, surrounding the murder of Yun Sun Jun, he had moved into her, uh, with her at her residence. In terms of confirmed locations where this subject, Bob Evans, has been, it's essentially three states that are confirmed. And we've run through most of the particulars already, but I'll recap them. The earliest we can account for him is here in New Hampshire. And again, it's late 1970s, 1977, 1978 is the rough time we're looking at, but it could be sooner, until 1981 when he leaves Manchester with Denise Bowden. He's then accounted for in the mid-1980s in California surrounding uh, the abandonment of, of Lisa in Cypress, California, in Scotts Valley. He's also confirmed to be in Felton, California at one point uh, during that investigation. The stolen vehicle out of Idaho, we estimate that to be some, it's somewhere between 1986 and 1988. There are people in Idaho who knew him, uh, who actually owned the vehicle that he took. We're not positive what name he was using at the time he was in Idaho, but we're confident that he was there. And then, of course, he's arrested in San Luis Obispo, California in 1988 with that stolen vehicle from Idaho. Lastly, uh, as he meets Yun Sun Jun up in Richmond uh, in the O2 era, we believe he was probably in that Richmond area for the years immediately surrounding 2002. But again, as Captain Grant said, there's a large chunk of time where he was a parole fugitive and, and we're not sure where he was, but these are the confirmed cities. These are the unconfirmed locations where we believe the subject may have been. And, and I stress that many of these states and much of this information is from documentation from the subject, Bob Evans himself. And as such, some of it has proven to be false and some of it, some of which we suspect is false. So in an effort to be all inclusive, we've included many of the states, any of the states that we have a link to. Uh, but again, I stress that these are not confirmed. Many of them are places that he said he worked in the course of his life. Some of them are places, specifically in the Wyoming area in the Midwest, where he said he was from in the early part of his life. And then he makes some references to, uh, to Canada as well uh, as the southern states. Of all these, I think Texas is probably of most interest to us. But again, as it stands, we have nothing completely confirmed. I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff Strelzen. So to summarize, based on the information we have about Bob Evans, his connections to New Hampshire, his specific connections to that Allenstown property, the owner of that property, the DNA that links him to that victim, uh, his linkage to the Denise Bowden disappearance, 
and his conviction as a murderer in California, we are confident that he is the person who killed those four people in Allenstown. Uh, we certainly have concerns about the mother of that middle child from Allenstown, uh, her whereabouts and whether she's alive. And we believe he also killed Denise Bowden. As far as future steps that we're taking, uh, obviously one of the most important ones is releasing this information in, in hopes that people come forward. I can tell you that after the release on December 28th, a couple people did come forward with additional information, actually provide us with those pictures from 1981 that we have of Bob and Denise uh, at a party around the summer of 1981. So we're hoping that happens as well in the future. Other future steps are that uh, we're using our friends in the DNA world to try and identify the four victims in Allenstown, do something similar to what we were able to do with Lisa and to see if we can track their relatives as well. We also plan to go back out to the Allenstown property and do more searching in the spring uh, identify areas that we may actually do some, ser uh, some searching underground, see if anything's buried out there, given what we know about Bob Evans and what he did with the victim in California. This is the contact information we're asking you to share with the public. We're asking if anyone has information about this person we know as Bob Evans to contact us. And as, as Captain Grant told you and Sergeant Koski told you, he's used a lot of different names. We have no idea what his life was like essentially prior to 1977. We don't even know exactly how old he really is. So he has a lot of history before then. And as Sergeant Kukowski told you, uh, there's a 12-year gap in California. And given what we know about him, we have concerns about his activities in California for those 12 years. So this is the contact information for people to let us know if they have any information about Bob Evans or about Denise Bowden or about our victims in Allenstown. And our, obviously our hope is that by releasing the information today to you and the public, that someone will come forward and allow us to identify these four victims and locate the middle child's mother. Uh, it's something that we all hope for, and it's something that Denise's daughter, Lisa, hopes for as well. Uh, she is a victim in this case. Um, she has gone on to have a good life, um, and she's grateful for everything that's been done on her behalf. Uh, and she sent us a message and she asked us to read it to you here today and I'll read it to you now. I am so thankful to be reunited with my grandfather and cousins after all these years. I want to send out a heartfelt thank you to all the organizations and tireless individuals who made this possible. As a victim in this incredulous story, I would like to ask that the media respects my privacy. Currently, I have three beautiful children and a loving husband and would like our presently happy and secure life to remain intact and protected through the release of this story. Please turn your focus toward the unidentified victims and other potentially unknown victims in this case, and hopefully their families will also be offered some closure as this investigation continues. Thank you, Lisa. And we obviously echo her hopes and wishes as well. That's the purpose of being here today. Um, as I said in the beginning, Normally we start with the identity of our victims and that leads us to the killer. Here we are confident we have our killer. Now we want to identify these victims and that's our goal. Uh, at this point, uh, we're happy to step out and take any questions if you have. I'll just remind you again that all these materials are available for you afterwards. There's even more detail in those materials themselves as well available for you. A disc with all those materials as well as a disc with all the photographs that were used today. So if there are any questions, we'll take them now. Otherwise, we'll conclude. Sir. Uh, just to get it on the record, I know the answer, but where is Dawn? Where's Dawn live? So, Dawn is Lisa, is Lisa, that's her name. She does not want that revealed as far as where she lives. So Lisa? Yeah. Asking where is she? You, you know, you're not going to tell us where she is. No, she's asked us to keep, to keep that private. You know, she's married with three children. She's having a great life. And, and again, she was a significant victim in this case. Uh, Bob Evans was an abuser, and so she's asked her privacy to be respected. Quick follow-up, quick follow-up. Um, sure. But, um, um, uh, do you have any evidence or, or any kind of comment about that 12-year period uh, in terms of finding more victims, murder victims? You know, we're, we're obviously concerned based on what we know about his, his proclivities that he could have certainly hurt other people. He's a person who did not want to be alone. He was, he was seen with other people. We have information that he was seen with other women and other children. You know, one theory is that he was using these children uh, not, not just as an abuser, but also as bait to lure other people to him. So we obviously have concerns about what he did during that 12-year time period. 
Um, we don't know, though. We don't know. Yes, ma'am. Sure. So all this information is going out through NICMIC and their partners, so it's going to be put out nationally uh, as we speak, so we'll see if we hear back. As far as the details, I just say he was an abuser uh, to respect the victims, but you know, that helps explain some of his motive for why, uh, why he was unfortunately gravitating towards children, but also explains why he ended up uh, killing his victims as he did. Yes, Mark. I'm a little unclear about Denise Bowen, when she was reported missing, how we were able to um, link Lisa to the cousin and then to Denise. And second question, would you call Evans a serial killer? Uh, to your last question, he certainly fits the profile of a serial killer. I mean, we have one confirmed victim, but based on what we have, again, we believe he killed four people in Allenstown, we believe he killed Denise, and we have concerns about the mother of that middle child. Um, Denise went missing right after Thanksgiving in 1981. I think the fairest way to, to put it, Mark, is that you know, different families have different dynamics. Uh, Denise and, and Bob Evans were having financial problems, and the belief from her family was that they left because of those financial problems. It was also the time frame before, before cell phones, before the internet, social media, so certainly it was not as easy to keep connections with people. Um, but all those things combined explains why she wasn't officially a missing person until most recently. And that's what caused us to search the property as well, and that's why the property wasn't searched until recently. So if she wasn't officially a missing person, how were authorities in California able to link Lisa to her? I'm sorry, I forgot that part of your question. It was through DNA. So Lisa wanted to learn about her background. She didn't really have much of a memory at all about her background, just shadows. And so um, through DNA tests on her, using various uh, websites that are available out there. They were able to link a DNA trail back to New Hampshire, back to Manchester, back to Cousins, and eventually right, right to her family itself. And so that's what led her back to Denise Bowden's family. It was, it was a DNA trail that linked them up. And we're going to try to use that same thing for the Allenstown victims as well, the rest of the victims. Um, yes, sir? The name uh, Elizabeth Evans, any reason to believe that could be the oldest victim uh, found in Allenstown? We, have, we don't know. I mean, you know, she pops up on the paperwork. He mentions her. Um, whether she's actually a real person or not, we simply don't know. We don't know. Was there any information about Evans and this other girl, the, the one in Allenstown? Anybody the middle child? The middle child. Do you have any information that people saw him with that middle child? Because they would have been together around the same time. Yeah, just, just to clarify that, and, and it speaks to the, uh, the question of Elizabeth, based on all the research, there is nobody who knows him to have had any kind of family, children, uh, other females, other than Denise Bowden. There, there are confirmed sightings um, of him with Denise Bowden, uh, based on the description, we believe it's Denise Bowden. Uh, but no other family, you know, the, the, working at the Wombeck, people who knew him there, nobody knows of any other family. Um, and again, this name Elizabeth just pops up in that paperwork. So obviously, that's something that's under uh, investigation and review, and we're trying to we're trying to get an answer on. And no sign of any human remains in that basement on Hayward Street. But is that possibly could that be the crime scene where at least some of these murders took place? That possibility. And would you be able to find that out? I would say potentially. Uh, all the search efforts that can be done, uh, you know, have been done. Um, but obviously, there's we're talking about a, a fairly big geographic spread where all these things are occurring. So it's certainly possible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so he kills his own uncle. You believe he killed his own child. We do. Yet he takes Denise's child, who's not his, on the road with him for right. a number of years. Can you elaborate a little bit on um, you know, what you, you said, maybe using a child with his date, but can you piece together a little bit of those early years just with her on the road, how he's acting, what he's doing? Or not really. I mean, you know, it's obviously puzzling as to why he would leave with a six-month-old. We've theorized that he left with Denise that, um, um, for a short period of time. So 
you know, we obviously, we checked the property at Haywood Street. We didn't think that she would be there. We thought he was probably smarter than that, given what kind of, we, what we know about his behavior. But it's certainly possible that he left uh, with her and the child, and somewhere, obviously, between New Hampshire and California, he killed her and disposed of her. You know, he, he had his reasons for keeping Lisa with him, and then he decided he didn't want her anymore. Uh, and then, you know, eventually moved on. We don't know who else he moved on to in those 12 years, but we know he ended up with Yunsun Jun. So w what's clear is that this is somebody who, who targets females uh, and specifically children as well. And again, you know, we know that he's an abuser. We know that that was part of the purpose. But beyond that, we just don't have any hard information. That's what we're hoping people, again, who can fill in the blanks between New Hampshire and California for us who may have encountered him. But this is a guy who was a chameleon who used different names. He was very careful about the details that he gave other people. People just didn't really know things about him. They, they said generally he was a strange guy but just didn't have a lot of information about him. Can you elaborate too on, um, you said that you are interested in Texas in particular, is there some reason that you're interested in Texas? Just different places that he, he was at or may have been. Uh, and again, probably using a different name at, at a lot of these different places. You know, because as Sergeant Kokoski showed you, there's a lot of different names that we know for sure he was using. And you know, it begs the question, what's he running from? And what, what he's running from is the fact that he's killing people. Um, that's why he's using these these various names. Yes, ma'am. Bob Evans is not her father. So there's been DNA work on done on that. It's been narrowed down. To some extent, we don't definitively know who the father is, but we know for sure it is not Bob Evans. Not Bob Evans. Um, Denise Bowden, um, can you comment on how close you are, or if there's any info about finding her? What, this is what I've just told you is the closest we are to finding her. We don't know where she went from the fall of 81. From that point on, she is never seen or heard from again. Lisa has some shadowy memories of a female figure, whether that's her mother or some other female that Bob Evans had met, we simply don't know. But Denise has never seen or heard from from uh, Thanksgiving of 1981. And again, based on what we know about Bob Evans, we believe that he killed her at some point between New Hampshire and California. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's all right. She could be, she could be alive? You know, I, I wouldn't. I don't think any of us would think that's a reasonable conclusion based on what we know. Is it possible? It's possible, but we think based on what we know, uh, the, the conclusion is that she's dead somewhere in between New Hampshire and California. And again, we're going to go back out to Allenstown and look just in case. The gentleman in the corner back there? You mentioned that he targeted women and children, but we don't know the fathers of some of those children. Uh, is your search also expanded to perhaps male victims? Well, it's any victims of Bob Evans. I mean, what, what we see here is a pattern of female victims. Uh, but you're right, we certainly don't know what happened to the fathers of those various individuals as well. Um, you know, we're trying to figure out his motive, kind of how he operated. You know, how, is he carrying on multiple lives at the same time? Approximately when is he killing one group versus the other group? Uh, you know, we simply don't know that right now. So you're right, we don't know what happened to those individuals either. You know, we know we have somebody who we believe is a serial killer, so there could be potentially be many other victims. Yes, ma'am. Can you explain again the connection between this Bob Evans or whoever was incarcerated in California and, and the New Hampshire cases? Explain again what ties those together. Sure, so the, the, the man, we, I'm going to call him Bob Evans, just easier. So Bob Evans uh, murders a woman in California partially dismembers her and buries her in a basement. The DNA confirms that he is the father of that middle child victim in Allenstown. Bob Evans is the same man who was with uh, Denise Bowden uh, in the time period before she disappeared here in New Hampshire. He worked uh, at the Wombeck Mills in Manchester with the person who owned the property in Allenstown where the four victims were found. He did work for that person, had, had been out to that property, was known to dump materials from the mill on that property, including those barrels. Uh, we know he was using various aliases. Obviously, he was concerned or worried about things. He certainly never reported 
that middle child is missing. We've never heard from the mother of that middle child. Uh, so that's generally the connections between him and Manchester in the Allenstown case. The middle link sounds like it was a DNA, that DNA search that hit on a cousin in New Hampshire that seemed to connect the dots between California and New Hampshire. Is that right? Well, that certainly connect, that, that brought Denise back, I mean, that brought Denise's back, daughter back to New Hampshire. But until we got the link that put Evans as the father of that middle child, I mean, it was all that evidence is coming together circumstantially to place Evans out there at the Allenstown scene, pretty significant evidence. But learning he's the father of that middle child explained a lot when we looked at the similarities in that group. You know, we have the four victims, but there's one victim who stood out as a little bit different than the others. Was with the others probably at the very end, but not in the very beginning. So how do you account for that? Not maternally related to the other three. Now we understand it. it's because Evans fathered that child with another woman. And at some point, that unit ends up together. Presumably, the mother of that second child uh, is gone in that process. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did anything ever come out after he was arrested in California during his incarceration? Did he ever say anything about As far as I know uh, regarding Yun Sun Jun, his victim in California, I, I don't believe so. I, I don't want to misspeak for Contra Costa County. Uh, regarding the New Hampshire cases and these connections, no. And, and we've obviously gone down the road of speaking to cellmates and people who would have interacted with him uh, at the time, but so far, no. There, there's no specific mention of his time here in New Hampshire. But did he talk about, did anything ever come out about his motive in, in the California case? Not that I know of. Against, my understanding is against his lawyer's wishes, he pled guilty. He pled guilty. Can you explain, um, it, it sounds like there are two different things going on. The daughter of Denise was searching for her family. And is it independently that his DNA was put into the system? Like, how did you go from the daughter to Bob Evans? I mean, was he, when he was convicted, was it under, was under a different name? So right. Was it's, his DNA entered when he was convicted? So he, He's getting linked up through fingerprints, so that in California, as they're running his fingerprints, these other names are cropping up. So they're starting to realize that this guy they know as Lawrence Vanner is actually all these other people, and eventually we're able to figure out that it's Bob, it's Bob Evans. So is, has, just in terms of the DNA, then, that you were able to get a match just in September, has his DNA been run through like the entire system where you've been able to? Is there a way scientifically to doesn't quite doesn't quite work like that, no. It's not like CSI. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't quite work. Doesn't there's all kinds of requirements about when you when you can put DNA in and where 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 you can do it and when and when you can do it. So I guess that's my question is that so in order to find out if this guy would be a serial killer and kill other people, other children, other women, whatever, you would have to individually check each case. There's not an automatic way that that's done. Like in other words, you need some evidence. Yeah, and, and really probably the best way is kind of what's happened here, which is his picture goes out and people say, oh, I recognize, he's the guy who stole my car in Idaho. I think that's likely how we're going to do it. You know, we may have, other than the hope that maybe we identify the Allenstown victims through DNA, I think we probably run out on the DNA as far as how far we're going to be able to go there, which is why the decision was made to release all these materials but to the public. In this case, but so potentially, there could be, you're, you're putting out this media blitz, I mean, or it's alarm post an alert. Um, basically, there are other cases around the country where they can look and say, we think this is the same guy. Could, you know, yeah. And they may, right, they may have something, right. But, you know, remember, a lot of these cases are probably going to be older. It was before, a lot of this was before DNA. And so, that, you know, that's what we're running into. So, uh, and certainly with the victims that we're finding, you know, given their age, a lot of times the samples can be degraded. So, again, there's some limitations there, but we're, we're doing the best we can. Yes, ma'am. I'll let Sergeant Kukowski talk about that. <clears throat> Absolutely, we're considering that possibility. Uh, it's well known there's a series of murders in Sullivan County area, the Connecticut River Valley uh, murders, as they're often referred to, amongst other standalone crimes around the state. Uh, I, I can say at this point, we, we don't have any specific concerns regarding any other New Hampshire cases. Obviously, we're, we're familiar with all those individual cases. Um, but it, as we move forward, and this is very much a work in progress, trying to account for this man and where he's been and what he might be responsible for, um, that, that's certainly something that we're keeping tabs on, yes. Can I get some thoughts? Are you shocked as everyone else as you'd be 
do you just peel away what you're finding? I mean, what's your reaction to what you're talking about here? Well, I think for you know everybody involved in this, Sergeant Koski said a lot of a lot of people involved in this case over the years. There are people here who've been involved with it a, a long time. I don't know if shocked is the word. I think we're, in a sense, we're happy that we've been able to make this progress because obviously, I just can't reiterate, if, if, in a homicide case, if you can't identify your victims, you're usually stuck. And so here, it's, it's, it's gone the opposite way, which is we've identified our killer. Now, hopefully, that helps us identify our victims. So I think we're extremely gratified that we've been able to make this progress. Now we're hungry for more. Now we really want to identify these folks, find the mother of that second child. Hopefully, maybe uh, Denise turns out to be somebody who's, uh, who's a Jane Doe in another state, some, some remains. And we've been looking into that as well. So you know, I think everybody is more optimistic than we ever have been about closing the pieces to the puzzle. Uh, disappointment that Bob Evans is dead and will never be held accountable for what he did here in New Hampshire and likely to Denise Bowden. But again, you know, so our, our happiness is tempered with that realization that he will never face true justice for what he did. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't use those terms. I mean, he certainly meets the criteria of being a serial killer based on how many victims we, we believe are here. Uh, you know, if you take the four Allenstown victims, you know, we have concerns about the mother of the middle child, Denise Bowden, and we know Yoon Soon Joon. You know, obviously this is a pattern for this individual. And we have a 12-year gap in California, and we have his whole life before the 70s in New Hampshire. We know nothing about, nothing about. Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, Lisa's interest in researching her own genealogy and how that played into the Lisa's interest in her own I mean, she's handed off to some people in a campground, uh, eventually placed in a foster home, and eventually adopted by a great family. Uh, you know, I think it's natural that someone would want to know their history. She, she just, as far as her mother, is no, she has no specific memories of her mother, just kind of shadowy figures. So um, you know, she was assisted trying to find out who her family is. And she's been extremely happy to find out who her family is, reconnect with her grandfather and her family back here in New Hampshire. So it's provided her with closure, and it's closure that she hopes the other victims in this case get. So she's gone on to a good life. We're extremely happy for her. But was it useful to the investigation? Absolutely, because it provi again, it's another significant link to Bob Evans um, because of his connection to Denise. And when you see what the investigators have found about Evans' link to that Allenstown property and the similarities, uh, you know, it, it certainly closes the gap on him as the killer. Would we know if she had been curious enough to start looking into her history? Would, was this the, the link that... It's an important before? catalyst, absolutely. Important catalyst. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned uh, possible military, possibly Navy. Is that based on, you know, a tattoo, or is that based on... Sorry. The, uh, it, it's more based on uh, some of the things, specifically in the documentation that we have. We, we have some documentation that this subject actually wrote. There's a, there's a letter that he wrote and, and things like that. Um, so it's based on little things, the way that he would write dates in the military fashion. Um, specifically, some of the people he interacted with at the Wombeck Mills, uh, the, the way he would fix certain things seemed to be kind of military tricks, so to speak. It, it's things like that. It's nothing concrete. Um, and again, we, we've got significant research underway to try and nail that down, but obviously it's tough not knowing the real identity. Things like that, exactly. You know, just things that, that uh, you know, speak to the military. And just back to the, uh, the adoption question, just one point to make with that. I think it was significant when he was caught in 2002 uh, for the Yunsun June murder. That is when San Bernardino, the DNA testing, confirmed that he was not Lisa's father. I think the, the, they, they thought that he probably was up until that point. So that was a game changer for San Bernardino's uh, investigation because now they have a, a living Jane Doe that they're trying to account for. If that makes sense. Yeah, can you uh, talk about the, the picture of the party in the summer of 1984? And just, we're not sure if it's the summer given Denise's pregnancy, so it might have been earlier in the year. It just has a date on it, and that's the date back then when pictures were developed. So we, we think it's earlier probably. Identify people who lived there and talk to them. 
Did they give you a sense of what was going on between the two of them? And did he know that that was not his child back then? Was he passing, was he, you know, when he was talking to people, did he say, this is my, this is be my baby? Yeah, we don't know that he, said, he talked to anyone about whether or not that was his child or not. As far as the relationship, uh, we've got some records that give some hints in the relationship between the two, and it, certainly I think it was tumultuous between the two of them, but not, not a lot of details, Did quite she frankly. Did uh, complain to the police that she was used by him? No police reports like that. No, so nothing like There are reports and some records that we're able to get some confidential records that I would say show it's not a smooth relationship between the two of them. That's the best I can give you right now. In the, the, what case, the gentleman in the corner back there, yeah? Yeah, so do you, uh, you're not sure at this point that Bob Evans is his actual identity? We're not. So in New Hampshire, he went with Bob Evans. As, we, as you saw in the slides, he went with at least five other confirmed aliases, potentially more names. So I think we're all pretty confident that his real name is not Bob Evans. Um, I think we'd be surprised if his real name was Bob Evans. And we don't, again, we don't know exactly how old he is, so we don't know how much of a life he had before he shows up in Manchester in the late 70s. So the, the hope is that people see his picture, hear about some of those activities, and say, you know, hey, I remember that guy with a woman and two kids, or I remember that guy with a woman and a kid, and maybe that helps us kind of back into who he really was and who the victims were. I'm sorry, couldn't you? Did he and his parents know that she had a daughter? Yes. They did. They did. Mark? Um, Alan's count three. Um, are you convinced that Evans had a relationship with them, or could it have been just a random thing? They, they like, their car broke down on the side of the road, and he picked them up and, and uh, took advantage. That's a good question, but when we look at his history, Mark, what we see is this is a guy who would form a relationship with these people. You know, he would ingratiate himself somehow. So could there be victims out there like that we don't know about? Certainly there could, but it certainly looks like this is a guy who didn't want to be alone, who would form relationships and take advantage of that relationship, and then at some point, obviously, he would end it. So. Two quick questions. Did you have a daughter? I don't believe she had any children. And uh, what, what name was Evans convicted of? Curtis Kimball. Curtis Kimball. Right. Yes, sir. Do you have a theory, working theory, about the dismember dismemberment, whether it was for convenience to stash the bodies away, or whether he actually did it as a part of the murders themselves? We simply don't know that. I mean, it's, you know, it certainly could be for packaging and disposal purposes. That's what would make sense. But is it is it part of you know, what he liked to do, we simply don't know that. You know, um, we simply don't know. It certainly made it easier. You know, the adult female and the oldest child were the larger of those four victims out there, so it certainly made it easier for them to package up. We don't know where he kept those victims. You know, did he keep them somewhere else for a period of time before he disposed of them? It seems like it was a pretty hasty disposal. You know, we, we surmise it was around the time that he left New Hampshire and headed to California that he just dumped those bodies out there because there were not significant efforts made to hide them. Jeff, I just want to make sure I'm clear on some of the questions. There are a lot of questions remaining. It's very confusing. You've been watching a press conference led by Senior Assistant Attorney General Jeff Strelzen involving a fascinating case and a possible serial killer operating here in New Hampshire whose identity uh, is almost unknown, really. He's been uh, identified as Bob Evans, but uh, any name is possible at this point. That uh, suspect, Robert Bob Evans, died in prison in 2010, uh, but now he's believed to have been involved in the uh, Allenstown cold case homicides. The link there is that he is the father of the middle of the three girls that were found buried in drums on a property there in Bearbrook State Park. They also believe he likely killed Denise Bodwin and then had her daughter with him for a number of years before dropping her with uh, strangers in California. He married a woman in California, a Yunsoon June, in the early 2000s. He killed her and was convicted of her murder in 2003 under the name Curtis Kimball. Bob Evans again died in prison in 2010. Uh, still a number of open ends to this investigation, but Bob Evans, now deceased, is suspected in five homicides here in New Hampshire uh, and convicted of murder in California. Of course, much more on this case coming up today at noon and our, our early evening newscasts. We now rejoin our regularly scheduled programming.